All right, guys, what's going on? We're here, special Friday night Poker Life podcast. My name is Joey Grimoyne, a.k.a. Chicago Joey. I'm joined today by a man who's been given the nickname. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait <laughs> to say, say your official nickname, but someone who you, you did a very recent prop bet that had a lot of uh, popularity in the community. You turned out successful, and now we're having you back on officially to learn more about you, my friend Donger Kim. AKA Big Dick Donger Kim. What's going on, Donger? Good. How are you? I'm doing really, really well, my friend. I appreciate you coming back officially on. And um, yeah, I'm happy to have you on, man. We want to learn more about you. Obviously, we had you on for the preview podcast where you and TC came on and broke down your prop bet. But now it's like an, uh, an official thing. Oh, sorry. Well, I totally blanked out for a second. <laughs> Did you ask Donner me? A <laughs> He's in La La Land. I mean, no, I made more of like something that said, like, I, my volume was adjusted, and I didn't know if I did something wrong because I was, like, fidgeting with something. Oh, okay, yeah. So I think your mic might have been um, might have been a little bit muted. But, yeah, man, how, how are things going? How are you doing, my friend? Where are uh, you at in the world right um, now? I've just got to Bangkok, like, a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Did some traveling. Took some time off of poker. But, uh... Um, here for a few more days, then uh, I'm going to be doing a lot of traveling again for the next few weeks, so that's about it. Just doing a lot of flying, which I hate doing, but I still do it. You, you hate flying, yet you travel all over? Yeah, I've, I've like, always been traveling a lot. Um, I would say I'm, like, I'm on a plane, like, on average, maybe once every three weeks out of the year, probably more often. And when I'm back in the U.S., I also drive a lot because uh, <clears throat> I live in Seattle and I go to Vancouver pretty often and I make that drive at least once a week. So I'm just always back okay. and forth. So when, you live in, so when you live in Vancouver, when you go to Vancouver, you just drive from Seattle to Vancouver then? Yeah, I went to school in um, Seattle and all my friends are from Seattle, so I call Seattle my home if I were to mm. call a place home, so... Yeah, Vancouver's like right, so probably my favorite city just because it's so close to home. Are you are you one of those people that likes to use a microphone but doesn't actually wear it on your head? Uh, I can wear it. Do you want me to wear it? Okay, some people some people said the sound might be a little bit bad on um on one of the things. I just gotta do this. Maybe I should upgrade my mic. No, I think the mic sounds good. It's just I don't know. Some people said it was kind of low on um. On the Twitch side of things, this is like a dual. This is like a dual stream. It's the second time I've done this. It's on my YouTube and on Twitch as well. And for those people that don't know who Donger Kim is, I guess Donger Kim is uh, one of the debatably one of the best high stakes heads up Nolan regulars right now in the world. You'd say is that that's pretty much true, correct? Uh, um, I would like to think I'm one of the best. <laughs> okay, he, BDDK is very modest about himself, guys. That's one thing you'll learn about him. I'm, I'm pretty sure. But you've been playing poker for quite a long time. You recently did a, a prop bet with uh, a man named Nick Frame, a.k.a. TC from the UB, and you guys did a, a prop bet challenge. Just tell us more about the challenge for those people that haven't heard about it. Um, Nick and I have uh, been playing heads up for a while now. We both like moved up from like small stakes, and um, I, he was, he's been talking about doing a challenge I uh, think about early last year, maybe like mid last year, and I kind of want to be the first one up to take him on up on his offer. And what happened was uh, I challenged him beginning of uh, February, and it was actually like a quick. Everything happened pretty quickly. Um, I was we like negotiated the terms pretty quickly, the stakes pretty quickly, the bets pretty quickly, and it just seemed like yesterday that I had to like wake up every day at like 11 a.m. to play in a frame and it's all over. Okay, so how much was the bet for? You guys made a side bet, correct? Yeah, the official side bet was um, 15k on the side and uh, we were going to play 25.50 for 15,000 hands. And then how much did you end up winning at the end of the challenge during the actual match itself? I think I won twenty or no, I'm sorry, hundred and five thousand. So twenty one buy ins. So is a hundred and five thousand is that a I mean twenty one buy ins, so is that like something that does that really be able to tell you who was the better player over that time period? I mean I guess in a way I guess it kind of does, but sometimes we hear twenty buy ins at heads up might not necessarily 
you know what I mean? Like it might not be super indicative of, of the skill level or who's better or who's not better. Yeah, I mean, anything, 15,000 hands is like still a relatively large sample. Going into it, I thought I was a very big favorite. And, uh, but I guess the results, they're not like extremely surprising, but it was like best case scenario. I didn't think it was like never going to happen, but this is like one of the much better results. I, yeah, I mean like, yeah, I would say so. Hmm. So I guess looking back at the challenge, like, what do you think, I, I guess what you can say, what do you think gave you the advantage in it? Do you think that you adjusted better than he did? Do you think that just maybe overall play style, you might have played a little bit better than him, you ran better than him? Like what do you think it was? <clears throat> I Actually, I think it was like a mixture of like a lot of things, but a lot of things went my way um, when they needed to. So, for example, right off the gate, it was like extremely swingy, and once I finally got a sample on Nick, I mean, uh, 15,000 hands is like a lot. I think I've only played 15,000 hands with like one other player, but after I finally got a sample on Nick, I, I started to make some adjustments, and I noticed that he made some adjustments, and I every adjustment I make, I made, I think I was like one step ahead of the curb, and I was, I was always, I, I knew Nick Frame would always like bring something new to the table, and um, when I really, really needed to like have hands, it just kind of always worked out, or especially towards the end, my strategy started changing, especially when I was like up like a reasonable amount in the middle of the challenge. My, uh, the goal wasn't to win the most amount of money, the goal was to win the last dollar, but obviously, like, it, to, with a certain expense. So I constantly had to adjust my strategy. And, like, towards the end, I was uh, up so much that I was so unlikely to lose. So at that point, it was to win the most dollar, or the most dollar amount, or to win the most money. Because hmm. I guess and sometimes in challenges like sometimes that, challenge. the people will they'll try to book the win, but you were up so much money, you didn't necessarily need to worry about actually winning the bet because you, you, you knew you'd win it anyway. So... You just kind of just tried to make as much as you could. Yeah, I mean, there was a point, I think, like, halfway to, like, maybe at the 10,000 hand mark, I had, like, a pretty nice lead. And um, winning had less value than uh, losing. Losing was, like, had a much more bigger consequence, I guess. So I just kind of had to, like, basically, like, act like it was there was a bubble coming up, but in a much more passive way. It didn't change my play too much. But generally speaking, like I didn't want to like have huge losing days and change my playing style, so it's like a little lower variance. Or I would probably win it, be winning a little less per hand, but just for the, it is a challenge, and it's just like one, yeah. So that's I kind of went from there. Hmm. So I guess we're. Um, so, I, I guess we're. Uh, I'm hearing a lot of feedback on, on your side and the speakers. Anybody hear that? Maybe it's just me. I guess I think. Uh, Tell me you guys can hear it. Make sure I just want to make sure the, the, the volume's okay on both ends for you guys in the chat. Just let me know. Um, how much of a help was, I guess, having somebody like WCG Ryder or, I guess, being friends with other uh, high-stakes heads-up no-limit guys, were those guys a help in terms of, uh, you know, figuring out different counter strategies and stuff like that, or was a lot of the stuff you were doing yourself? I mean, actually, they just made me more nervous. The, the, like, I, it was me playing the challenge, and... um. I. It was actually a lot more stressful than I thought it was gonna be, um, because on any given night, if I was playing anybody, I wouldn't have like all the stress of like this whole challenge. It's not so much that people were watching, but it was more that I had to do this every day, and it was there was like an end goal. And now that it's all over, it was actually a lot of fun. I mean, I guess it's more fun if you win, but um, I guess my friends that were. They weren't really even there. Like when I finished the challenge, like they were not even in Melbourne. They were like on some wine cruise and like just having a good time. And it was just really just me alone. I thought when the challenge was gonna finish, I would have like my girlfriend next to me, all my friends there. It wasn't like that at all. It was just me alone. Went straight to bed after. Sounds kind of sad, man. When you when you put it like that. I, I, well, there was a point where, like, I think we had our, like, celebrating, celebratory dinner, like, a few days before the challenge actually ended, which was also a little weird, but all my friends insisted. Hmm. 
I know I saw your girlfriend on Twitter. She she fired a, a little bit of a shot at at TC from the UB post. Yeah, that, I was also not there for that. That 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 really surprised me. I didn't. She's really not. She's like the very standard quiet Asian girl. Or maybe she's not quiet, but like that surprised me. I don't know where that came from. Yeah, I thought it was. Uh, I thought it was kind of funny. Maybe you know. I guess at some point, I guess you don't really want to. You know, after you have a victory in a prep bet, you take so much money off someone. You don't really want to needle them like that. But it seemed like she she just decided to go for it. Yeah, because I'm definitely not a shots fired kind of guy. I that's that's not me. I don't like to shoot. No. You think she's been hanging around with the evil empire too much? Uh, all those guys who much enjoy. You know, talking shit on Twitter. Possibly, I, I don't know. It surprised me though, that's for sure. Hmm. Did, uh, well, I thought another. Well, I guess the the one other big thing that happened during the bet was that this nickname was born for you, and the yep. nickname, of course, of course, is Big Dick Dong or Kim. Now, are, do people call you that now and regularly? Like your girlfriend was calling you it on Twitter and Instagram. Like, are people? When you see people now, are they referring to you as Big Dick? Is that your, become your new name? Yeah, a little bit more often than before, I guess. No one's ever called me that before. Yeah, I guess. It's, it's pretty funny because um, uh, on Sundays I, I play tournaments, and uh, it's always censored out. I don't really – I, like, forget that it's Big Dick. I just see the big censored, and I always think it's, like, Big Fuck. Huh. What do you mean? Where are you seeing this at? Where are you seeing this at? Uh, on stars, or I always see it's maybe it's not. Is Dick censored? I'm pretty sure it is. Um, I don't. I can try typing. So people were calling you that in the chat on there. Yeah, I feel like I get a little bit more attention in a on the online MTT scene. I guess when I'm just like playing. I don't really play a lot of tables, so I like usually see the chat. Mm. I play like four or six. Mm. Okay. So are you going to World Series of Poker this year? Yeah, I'm going to continue my journey to try to win a tournament. Well, I actually challenge everyone listening out there. Man, the feedback on your end. Are you, are you have the volume on your headphones? Uh, no. I, I Actually, should I? I think this is probably better if I like let me try to do this real quick. Yeah, let's. I can kind of hear myself through your speakers. speakers. Yeah. Echo, the echo, echo, echo. Is this better? Um, One, two, three. Hello. Is this better? Um, maybe. Well, let's try it like this for a little while. All right, we'll try it like this for a bit then. A lot of reverb. Yeah, I think it uh, might be go away if you because sometimes if you have this setup where I guess in the audio settings on Google at the top you can change. Um, where you're hearing the volume from. So, and that will usually sometimes either it might be switched to your speakers or your computer, and, and sometimes on your headphones. Okay. I, now it's just coming from. Yeah. All right. Cool. Yeah, I actually challenge everyone out there. If you see Donger at World Series of Poker, please call him by his nickname, Big Dick. Whenever you see Donger, yell out to him, Big Dick, Big Dick Donger Kim. That's my challenge to everyone out there listening. <laughs> If you see Dong or Kim at the World Series of Poker, let him know you like his nickname, and please shout it out to him if you see him. And if you do that, please then let me know that you did that so I can then enjoy it as well because I, I, I'd love to see that happen. So I, that, would, that, would make me, uh, that would make me very happy. And you mentioned something about tournaments. You mentioned that you've been, I guess, you don't like tournaments. You've been firing some, I don't know if you've been firing shots at tournaments or you just don't necessarily <laughs> like tournaments or there's been some things you said about tournaments, I guess. And No, no, what's... I, it's just uh, a friend of mine that quotes me. I, I'm not a big shots fired kind of guy, but um, I guess I'm like a little apprehensive because uh, I've had such great results in cash, but like the complete opposite in tournaments, like it, it almost cannot be any worse. Hmm. And... So, so you're saying tournaments are, are not like what do you, what do you, what do you think about tournaments then? What's your viewpoint on them? Uh, I guess I thought it would be much easier than it really is. Um, I've always thought like the quality of play was pretty poor compared to heads, um, cash games in general. 
but at the same time, a lot of those guys have pretty good results, and they probably know something that I don't, and uh, I don't know. I just can't seem to, you know, squeeze one to the final table and, like, win one. Well, how long have you been trying to play these tournaments? I mean, what's your sample size here? Is it, like, 10 tournaments, 20, 100? Uh, I've been... I've probably played, like, 10 Sundays. Wait, that's a lot. No, no, that's not 10 Sundays. More like six Sundays this year. Last year, probably about that. Um, I don't play tournaments during the week. That that would just be too much for me. Um, and I've probably played like in. I, I did Barcelona. I did Florida. I did WPT for a couple events in uh, this winter. Did Aussie Millions. Did PCA. And that's about it. I'm going to Korea in a few days to try to snipe the Korean one. I would be pretty happy if I won the career one. So that would be picture perfect for me. So it kind of sounds like you, you, you've tried, you played a decent sample size. Are you working on your tournament game at all? Are you, are you in the lab with Pratouche? You know, shout out to Pratouche, by the way. You said you're a friend. You didn't even say Pratouche by name. Isn't it? Our friend oh. of the podcast, guest of the podcast, Pratouche, of course. Shout out to Pratouche, man. The, Pratouche. Uh, the brunette girl grinder himself, man. The pussy loving Pratouche is, is what we call him over here in, uh, in the <laughs> USA side of things. But... So have you been like running simulations? Are you trying to get better? Are you, I mean, every literally every tournament player in the world makes videos or streams on Twitch now. So I think there's a lot of resources to get better if you decided that you wanted to get better at tournaments. Have you tried anything like that, or are you just going off relentless aggression and heads up, no limit skill? Um, <clears throat> probably more the latter. I'm a bit. I think I just don't know where to start. Um, I would. I'm actually just trying to play as many uh, Sundays as possible so I can get a sample and go from there. And um, apparently my sample is still not big enough, and I hopefully hopefully I'm just, I don't know. I'm just waiting for a sample and then going, going from there, but th some, something is just not working. Hmm. But I don't know. I think like some of the best players uh, may not do well, or some of like the worst players just seem to win one. So it's really hard, it's really hard to tell. Like, being... A tournament pro, like man, hats off to you. It's really, really tough. That's a tough game type. It's probably got like got to be like one of the toughest game types to be like a pro in making a living. Cause like it, unless you're like doing really well and like you're, it's it's very scary. Yeah, I think um, you know you always wonder how many people are actually making a living off tournaments and with all the staking and the backing and the buying pieces and selling pieces. It's like you don't really necessarily need your own bankroll to play tournaments, which kind of makes it unique in the poker world, I feel like. And, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I think t making a living at tournaments is definitely pretty hard. Is it do you think that it's hard because, I guess, it's hard to just be successful at tournaments in general, or do you think it's hard because everyone is really good? Uh, I do not I think everyone is really good. I, I That's not the case... I definitely don't think that's the case, but um, there's just a lot of variance in tournament poker. Uh, I I, <laughs> I do not think everyone's very good. That is for sure. But I'm sorry, guys. I'm with tournament players. I, I'm, I was, that was like a very subtle troll. I thought that was me just that was me setting you up because I knew your answer to that question. But go ahead, continue on what you were saying. I think I would like to think that I have an edge on the field. Um, and I do do a lot of work with tournaments, but it, it just always like seems like an easy excuse to just say it's like a sample size thing. But it, this tournament adventure is like actually really important to me. I um, would like to win one. That seems like one of the things I would like to do in my poker career. Uh, this Nick Frame challenge was like it felt great winning it, and I can only imagine how great like a tournament would be. Do you think that when you actually win a tournament, it's going to feel as good as you might imagine it feeling right now? I don't think it will be. I think when you win it, you'll be like, oh, fuck, okay, that was it. And then you'll, then you know, then it's like, uh, now what? I don't know. I just feel, feel like a lot of unfortunate things have happened towards the end of a tournament or, like, just when I get deep. I, but, like, you, everything needs to go right. That's the only way you, like, really win. 
if, if, if you run really well deep. I guess well, a lot of people, like you take a look at some, you know, these big hands that happen in the in like the main event. You know, if one card goes differently, you might not see one of the World Series champs be considered a great player or a good player or whatever if he doesn't hit that card. You know what I mean? Like so much of some people's reputation kind of lies in one card or one river or one hand deep in the tournament for this. Yeah, definitely. And this is it's probably why I decided to make a transition into tournaments um, in the first place because I think that's the most profitable game type next to Heads Up No Limit. So you think tournament poker is the most profitable game type next to Heads Up No Limit? Yeah, there's a, a lot of recreational players and I think like even the pros may um, not be the best. Or a lot of like I feel like a lot of MTT pros are sort of like on the lazier side. They don't like work hard off the tables, whereas like maybe it's just because I have more cash friends that work really hard off the tables. But when I play these live tournaments, like it's uh, just they're just I just see them being as like good value, and uh, I go from there. Hmm. What well, I guess do you often talk with you know Doug and shout out to Doug by the way. Doug's in the chat. Doug. Doug's that may, uh, Doug's claiming he heard it here first. Donger wins a prep, uh, wins his first bracelet in 2015. And also, guys, we are live streaming this on YouTube and Twitch. If you have any questions or comments, you go ahead, feel free to leave them in the chat. Any questions for Donger? Anything you want to know about him? Um, actually, David Afronsky says, "Puppy, ask him what his rank is in StarCraft II. You still play StarCraft II? What's your rank in StarCraft II? We're uh, big fans of StarCraft II around here." Uh, I I think I'm the third one up from the bottom. Not very impressive. I don't know if it's um it's below platinum. Is it gold? No, no, no. I'm out of. The, I got out of the gold league. I'm not sure. I'm not really good. But I I used to watch a lot of StarCraft, and I was like uh, a StarCraft fan for a little while. But man, that game is too tough. That's that's another tough game. I, I decided to play tournaments instead of StarCraft. Do you think if you were a natural-born Korean citizen and not an American-born citizen that you would ha be better at StarCraft? Definitely. I've always played a lot of video games in my life. Um, I still do occasionally. I play um, Counter-Strike. Mm. It's like a first-person shooter game. But other than that, I try to stay away from video games because um, I've spent so much of my life playing video games and I don't really want to do that. I just try to stay busy in front of the computer. What else besides playing poker do you stay busy doing? Do you have like something else you're learning? Are you just fucking around on Reddit and then 2 plus 2, talking to people on Skype? Like, What, what would you say you're doing? Uh, I actually read a lot of travel blogs despite traveling a lot. So you Yeah, they're just like just boring travel blogs. Um... I guess I'm like constantly looking at the poker lobby or just doing a lot of PT4 stuff. Most, a lot of PT4 stuff. That's just a lot of my day. Hmm. So you're, you're you're just in Poker Tracker Four, figuring out what you could be doing better at Heads Up No Limit specifically. I guess not much tournament work, right? Tournament work, some tournament work. I would say definitely tournament work. Um, just to see what's working and what's not working. Hmm. Okay. Makes sense. Uh, what did uh, does he know Donger from League of Legends? No, I know I've been referenced that a few times. The whole quote unquote raise your dongers. I was wondering what that meant, but I think that's from uh, League of Legends, right? I'm not sure. I always see people in the chat on Twitch and, and YouTube say raise your dongers. I wasn't sure if that was well, I guess it's obviously not for you, but I think I saw some people say it about you as well, so I wasn't sure if that was about you when you were. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a League of Legends thing. Okay, Noru says, Donger looks like a Korean movie star or a porn star, which actually I find that to be very true. You kind of do look like a movie star or a porn star. Like, it could honestly go either way. Do you or a porn it... star? <laughs> oh, that's the first. I mean, that's what Noru says. I'm not, I, don't, I guess I agree, but I'm, not, I'm curious what other people's, uh, if, they, if they think that's true or not. So, Where do you see this, um, these questions? These are these are on the YouTube chat. The link I I think I sent you the the link on on Twitter. I tagged you on Twitter. The link you posted on Twitter. You can go there. Just mute the audio. You can see people commenting on there. Do you uh do you have any plans, Ryan says? Do you have any plans to venture into six max? Because obviously it looks like heads up no limit. Wait, actually first, do you think heads up no limit? What do you see the action going? It's as the action died down the same. Like where do you see the future? 
I guess, the short-term future for Heads Up No Limit at online poker going for you and in general? Um, I, for Heads Up No Limit, I try to be there for the good spots. Um, I don't expect me to play... To, I don't expect to play too much against uh, other regs, but I... That may change, just like... Uh, just like anything, no one's really stayed at the top for a very long time. I think the only person that's really tested like time was uh, Ike. I can't really think of anyone else that's like stayed up at, as a t top heads up no limit player. So I assume there will be a time where not necessarily where when I move like my skill isn't like as good, but there will be other players that believe that they're as good or better than I am. So um, I don't think it's like the end of my heads up no limit career. Mm -hmm. So you say you see yourself playing mostly heads up no limit when you play cash for the foreseeable future then? Yeah, I mean I think I mean I don't really have like I th would think that I would still be getting some heads up no limit action um eventually. Very rarely does someone just like not stay at the top or maybe like stars will slowly change their King of the Hill system or maybe something more aggressive or something's got to give. I, I think, like, it's very unlikely to say that, like, no one will, no one, no top player will ever play me from here on out. Hmm. Do you think that you doing this challenge and being successful at it and kind of being very successful in the challenge, do you think that deters other players out there from wanting to even play against you or shot against you at all, whereas before they might have played you? I actually think it's quite the opposite. I've actually had like a lot of people just randomly play me just because uh, they probably know me from the ch challenge now. Um, and like before the challenge, I don't think there was. I think I don't think there was a player that would have played me but decided not to play me post challenge. I think that's always been the same. And the only difference is I guess I'm a little bit more well known in the the two plus two community, whereas I was just really well known in the high stakes heads up community. Mm, makes sense. Do you have any uh oh I know a lot of the heads up Nomic guys, some of the some of the good players, there's you know like WCG Ryder, of course uh, TC from the UB, uh, of course one of the best, Dan Murr, you know, they've been kind of playing more heads up PLO these days. Do you have any intention of playing more heads up PLO? <laughs> I, I do that's a that's a that's much that's a much tougher transition. Like six max cash or tournaments are probably an easier transition, but I imagine heads up PLO is going to be a little bit more fun. I mean, I do play sometimes, but I would say like a few thousand hands a month or something. But mm -hmm. I'll get to it. I I know like, <clears throat> for example, Ike has been saying that for a while, and now he's like doing really well. So I, I hopefully I'm like the next Ike that like gets really lazy for a really long time and puts it off and hopefully one day do really well. Are you referring to Isaac Hollywood Hexton? Is that who you're referring to right now? Mr. Dream Hollywood Machine Hexton. himself? Oh, okay. Hollywood. Mr. Dream Machine himself. Yeah, well, he's got the Dream Machine, though. When you have the Dream Machine at PLO, <laughs> it makes your learning curve much easier. Also, he plays a lot of six max, too, and he does short stack as well a lot. So I guess, you, do you have any experience short stacking? No. No, yeah, I mean, for at no limit, but not like short stacking PLO, that seems like another game. Another game all in itself. Well, that's where the Dream Machine comes into play. The Dream Machine helps you run those simulations and figure things out, and then it makes you the the most effective PLO player. Yeah, Hollywood Hacks has been doing really well at PLO. If you, if you check out Russian PTR, his results have been very, very impressive. And I don't know, has he been playing any No Limit lately at all, or is he just now a PLO guy? Uh, he plays some No Limit. Um, I, th I see him pop in, in and out, but mostly PLO. The great game of PLO, man. Even WCG Rider, I saw him in a recent Phil Galfon video where he was playing Phil Galfon heads up at PLO, man. Yeah, I've uh, uh, yet to see that video. i got to sign up in for the Run It, Run it Twice site to watch it, I guess. Do you, uh, why do you think that win rates are bigger at tournaments as compared to potentially PLO heads up slash six max? Um, I don't think win rates are bigger in tournaments, uh, but I do think it's a much easier transa uh, transition so I can spend less time doing it, whereas like heads up PLO I would almost be working from the ground up. Well, you said earlier that you thought tournaments were the second most profitable 
compared to Nolan and Cash. Do you think that tournaments are more profitable than PLO Cash, Six Max, or Heads Up? Um, it's <clears throat> it's ironic because I believe that like tournaments are probably the not most sustainable, but there seems to be a lot of like new blood in tournaments, whereas like any form of um, online heads up, it, sure. there's probably not so much new blood. So uh, that's probably the reason why like I believe tournaments are very important. But if I truly believe that like a tournaments were a dying game and decided that like everyone's jumping into heads up PLO, that would be like my hundred percent my main focus. But I think just like any top player that like is kind of at the end of the the I guess, like, after playing everybody and, like, on a consistent basis when I don't get too much action, I have to look for other game types. And I think every top player has done that, and it's sometimes it hasn't worked out for the better, but sometimes it has. Yeah, I think some people now, it's kind of like the guys who switched over to PLO are now actually playing more 8-game, you see. So now it's they're playing 8-game and the 10-game, mm -hmm. and there's the... 25 game. I'm not even sure. I mean, there's. I think there might be like a 25 game tournament. I believe there was on Full Tilt a couple weeks ago or something like that. So, obviously, there's Open Face Chinese. Do you play any of that type of stuff at all? I know people are pretty big into gambling on that. No, I used. I played like when it f was uh, really popular before, like Pineapple. I think this was like three years ago. But since then, I've just I haven't played it. I no. Don't play open face. I, I try not to be on my phone all day. Like I used to be the guy who was on his phone like like at lunch or just 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 about whenever. But now I'm like quite the opposite. I try not to be on my phone or if I don't have to. If it's not important, I'll just get back to it later. Uh Vo check says on Twitch, new blood in tournaments like you, basically. So you're saying people like you come play tournaments and then give new blood to the tournaments, and then you are kind of the I wouldn't say a complete fun player, but I'm sure the tournament players might view somebody like you coming over to play tournaments as they're like, this is why I play tournaments, because you have guys like this coming to play these higher buy-in tournaments, and they might not necessarily you know, know what's happening in a lot of these spots. Yeah, I mean, it's just a new, like, I'm not a MTT pro, like, so it, I'm just another new player in, uh, to the scene. I'm <laughs> definitely not a recreational player, but... Uh, that was yeah. Vobchek. That was a um, that was a funny comment, by the way. Thank you for that comment. That was <laughs> new blood like you. <laughs> <laughs> I really wanted to laugh a lot at that comment, but I held it in until I actually said it, and now I just can't contain myself. So I know a couple people were saying, you know, I, I was telling people I had, we we're gonna have you on, even though we just like we we're, we've been doing this, we've been planning to have you on for a bit. You were doing some traveling. You know, where'd you come from, right? Like as you said before the challenge, you weren't very well known. Like where, like. You know what? Like, where, like, what's your, what's your? Well, literally, we don't usually ask stories, but like, what's your poker upcoming? Like, what, like, how did it work? What happened? Where were you living? You know, like, how did you end up in in Korea or in Melbourne playing poker? How did you get there? Well, I actually started from um, playing a uh, sit and goes, and I've st played started with like two dollar sit and goes, and then moved up to five dollar sit and goes. This is all from like the the lowest deposit, and this is um 2009, I believe, and uh, there was, it's actually pretty funny, I used to play like such a nit, so, like basically the tighter I was playing, I thought the better I was playing, like if I had like a hand like king 10 off with like three BBs left, three handed in a sit and go, I would just fold the button just because like it's, they're, they're not aces, but I, this was like six years ago, I was such a donk. And um, <clears throat> so I was like, I was, I was really good at waiting it out. Just like a lot of Asians out there, they just waited it out, waited for the aces. They can settle for ace king. So there was this one time where I saw a thirty dollar. Um, this is full tilt. So the, you know those um that deep stack symbol with like the blue li blue and white lines sa saying yeah. that it's like a deep stack tournament. I saw one of those, and um, I think it, the buy-in was like twenty or thirty bucks. And I did. This is my first time ever playing an MTT, and I actually didn't know it was an MTT. I uh, I registered, and I didn't know there was such thing as a, a, a late regging. That was new to me. So this like one table tournament turned into like tons of players, and like at this time, I think this was like maybe like ten percent of my bankroll. So I'm panicking. Like like I was such an it. I just never wanted to lose. 
So now I'm playing a game where like it's like six times higher than my average stake, and I just waited it out. I kept waiting for aces, and things just worked out, and I actually won my first tournament. Picture perfect. I actually won my first tournament. Actually, I don't even know if I won it. Maybe I got second. I don't remember. But I, I think I won. In your mind, you won it. In your mind. How you remember it, you won mind. the tournament. Yes. I actually thought I won an online tournament a few months ago. Or actually, not a few months ago. Uh, maybe about a year ago. But I was so delusional that I actually didn't win it. I just got, like, fifth. But I final tabled, and I thought I won it. <laughs> are you, like, uh, are you playing on performance-enhancing drugs? You don't, like, remember what's happening or what? No, like some like I was in Vegas and I was talking to some of my friends and they were talking about what it felt like to win a, a tournament on a Sunday, and I thought I had some insight on it and like I, and a friend of mine reminded me that I didn't win it and I thought I did. Huh. Okay. What the fuck? <laughs> oh, um. Maybe maybe I got like yeah. fourth. Have you ever done? Yeah, it was. So with the nickname and people uh, making some speculation, you look like a porn. I mean, is there is there a chance you did some porn and you don't remember? Like, is that why people in the chat might be uh, thinking you did the? Uh, would you remember? Like, do you forget a lot of things? Is this a common thing with you or what? No, I think I was just so happy to final table. It was um the Sunday 500, either on full tilt or stars. I don't know which one has the 500. Maybe it wasn't 500, but it was one of the the, the non-200 ones, and I was so excited to final table, and I guess like fast forward like a few months, I thought I won it. In my mind, I already won it. Well, in our minds, you won it too. Okay, so let's go back to your career. How, how'd you get into Heads of No Limit? How'd you get playing 2550? How'd you get being ranked on the top 10 on some of the power rankings list pre-prop bet? Okay, so after I won that tournament, I think I decided that I wanted to try... I had some expendable money to try and learn how to play cash. And I knew that was like... And this is, at this point, I was still um, uh, not a professional. It wasn't like my main source of income. So I started grinding 10 cent, 25 cent, tw 25 cent, 50 cent. And I think once I got to like 50 cent, 1 dollar, I decided to like play poker professionally. This was in uh, 2010, and I moved up to 1-2, and that's where I was. I played a lot of 1-2-6 max for a very long time, and then Black Friday happened. And once Black Friday had to, happened, I had a lot of money on full tilt. And so I decided to move to Vegas, and I played live 2-5 for about, like, maybe six months. 2-5, 5-10. Oh, yeah. That, at the time, that wasn't like anything. I never thought I would ever make it to high stakes. Like it sounds really weird to say. I didn't give myself enough credit. And uh, after playing live two five, I like kind of recovered a little bit, and I just didn't want to be in Vegas anymore. I actually just hate playing poker in a casino if I don't have to be. Like that whole lifestyle was like really really tough. And um, I've always wanted to do a lot of traveling, but with that money on full tilt, I couldn't do any of that traveling. So despite my situation, I decided to do some traveling anyway. So did a long trip to Asia, went to Macau to play some poker, then to Taiwan with a friend, then went to Korea, then I think Thailand. And in Thailand, that's where I met Doug in 2011. And uh, Doug invited me over to his house for the summer, or maybe that's something along those lines. Maybe I invited myself over. <laughs> I probably did that. And then I started playing Heads Up No Limit. And since then, I've just been like moving, trying to move up the stakes. And uh, I like seeing Doug move up the stakes from the very beginning really inspired me. And with his guidance, I was able to do it. But it definitely wasn't easy. I moved up and down. I mean, I've taken many, many shots at 2550. The next thing you know, I'm playing 3-6 do it again, and that was, like, a long process. Yeah. It's just, the caliber of players at 2550-plus is much different. That is the, the toughest stake jump. So you think 1020 to 2550 is the toughest stake jump at Heads Up No Limit? Yeah, it's, um like, the biggest stake, uh, stake jump in terms of money and skill. Hmm. Because from 2550 all the way up to the highest stakes... Uh, especially in, uh, specifically in No Limit Hold'em, it's really the same player pool. Like very few, 
if someone wanted to play 100 or 200 and they're like a 25, 50 reg, I'm sure they would probably have the money to play 100 or 200 just sell a little bit. But those games just don't run in like, the skill level is generally the same. So when you were shot taking, what was your like strategy? Were you were you only playing against uh, fun players? How many buy-ins like did you approach? Like what was your like what was your approach to that? Would you drop down if you lost a certain amount? Yeah, I mean obviously I would choose like what I thought was the weakest player, but in many cases I wasn't ready and I thought I was a better player than the player I was playing, but I really wasn't ready for it, and that happened like many many times. And I actually didn't realize I got beat until a couple of years later, until I finally made it to high stakes. So when would you say you um, finally made it to high stakes? Like, what Like what was the, uh, you know, what was the, point, the, the turning point there? The turning point was actually about a year and a half ago. Um, right when, it was actually really, really good timing. Right when um, Stars uh, implemented Soft King of the Hill, I was probably, on average, the tenth or eleventh person in the lineup work that so basically I wasn't able to get a table at one point. So that kind of like helped me, I guess, to maybe play like weaker players that might have not played me just to like um, play a rec player. So that since then, like uh, I've really made my way up and established myself in the high stakes community. So where do you but go before? To... Go ahead. What was that? I said go ahead. Uh, before that, I was just probably just viewed as like a 5, 10, 10, 20 player. And I was, I was probably playing a 5, 10, 10, 20 as my main game for a very long time. Hmm. So I guess so well, definitely well, right, now, so right now you're here. Where do you go from here? You know, where is there any more room to go up in Heads Up No Limit for you? Is it now is it just about getting the motivation to maintain the level you're playing at? Like well, what happens now for you, you think? Uh... What happens now is definitely tournaments. I'm going to try to win one of these. My my whole focus is really going to be tournaments. Like just like uh, how I've worked hard and with heads up no limit, I think I can do apply that in tournaments. Do you have like a tur- a tournament player you look up to? Do you have any tournament guys like you that you really respect or that you you admire that whose games you can look at and kind of like Yeah, um, it's definitely. I think um Especially when I pl- I've played with them, not so much like their tournament record. I mean, that's some of those guys like who have like great tournament records. Actually, is actually quite impressive. But the people I admire in the tournament world are probably like Pratt, Doug, Dan Smith, Tony Gregg. I think those guys are all great players. Um, I think a lot of it is because when they play a hand and I see a showdown, like I would have played it somewhat similarly or um, I just think they play very, very solid. Hmm. Interesting. I mean, there are like a bunch of players that I'm just missing, but those are just like off the top of my head. That makes sense. So I guess now you plan to play a lot of online tournaments. Are you going to play high rollers, softer 10Ks? What do you, what do you, what do you plan on playing exactly to get good at tournaments or to get better? I, I'm going to try to be in as many tournaments as possible, but definitely play as many online tournaments. Um. I think I'm an online player at heart, so I really do enjoy playing online, like at the comfort of my home, just in front of a computer. Okay, so you're gonna play mostly online tournaments then? Yeah, I would think so. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, CG asks, he says, does he think a win rate is sustainable in high rollers slash softer 10Ks with all the travel costs for tournaments? For some people, yes, but I don't think it's sustainable for a reasonable percentage of players that play them regularly. How much of a how many percentage of players do you think it's actually sustainable for? I think it's sustainable for man. I'm, you're just asking like I think it's sustainable for a solid twenty five percent of like the players that I see, like, in basically every one of them. So, out of, like, 100, let's just say about 50 players regularly go to these, like, most of the stops, I would think, like, like a very small percentage, like 10 to 15. It's just the the bankroll needed, the travel costs, um, 
just everything is so expensive. Everything is just such high stakes. It really, really is. So, but it, I mean, honestly, it's a lot of fun. Um, the most fun I've ever had was uh, at Barcelona. I don't think I cashed a single tournament, but being at Barcelona, the PokerStars like tournament is like run really well. <clears throat> the food is great. Like it was warm. I, I just like Barcelona a lot, and I I'm actually looking forward to like a lot of the EPT stuff specifically. When you when you go travel to tournaments, are you planning to actually go sightsee? Like, do you is that do you look at it as the time to like see people that you're friends with and hang out with them? Or are you just focusing on poker in je- like itself? Like, what's your like? How do you like? How do you take in tournaments? Because like, I when I went to the the LA PC stuff, I guess technically I wasn't there for LA PC, but I was wondering. I was like, what do these guys do to like enjoy themselves? You know, because they're in the casino and but there's all these people you see at all these stops, so I feel like you'd want to hang out with them and have fun and enjoy yourself, but at the same time, you also want to play poker, so it's kind of like, you know, I wonder how people balance that. Like, what's your approach about it? Um, Poker's number one, for sure. I'm going there on a business trip to, like, hopefully be profitable, but um, I generally like to get there a few days before and stay, like, a little after, because I just try not to fly if I don't have to. But going to a new city was really cool. I think I would like to do a lot more of the EPTs, and um, maybe the Barcelona won't be as fun, just because it was like my first EPT experience. Uh, but at the same time, I also remember the Rio being really fun on my first time, which was like four or five years ago, and that's kind of weird, right? What are you saying? The Rio isn't fun? It's just not the the best casino out there. Um. I'm not gonna fire any shots at Rio, man. You never know, Rio. Shout out to Rio, man. I, don't, I never know. I might, I might be. You never know about the Rio, man. But yeah, it maybe it might not be. I guess that's true. Yeah, they actually guess- try. They do a good job with. I mean, if you think about it, EPT is probably a much more enjoyable experience. But the Rio, they have like thousands of people in a tournament, whereas like that's not really the case in an EPT. So like, considering that, like, I think they're. Might be they might be the only casino that can like really truly run a tournament that big on a consistent basis. Like, uh, how else would you do that? That's so many players to manage yeah, all that. Like, shit, it's like a shit show. <laughs> it seems like it, it, and most of the European cities are more enjoyable to be in than Vegas because it's so hot in Vegas. Everyone's drunk. Like, if you're there trying to play poker and trying to actually do well, Vegas doesn't necessarily seem like the most ideal setting for that. I think. Yeah, like, I mean, I think so. I guess I guess it's kind of obvious though, but I mean, some people might disagree with that. I suppose. I mean, I I like I only like being in Vegas to see my friends. I or it's like the West Coast, so I can go home or something along those lines. I'm not a big fan of like the Strip and like the drunk people and like I, I I'm not I don't really like dr- I don't drink and um not much of a partier. So Vegas is like kind of the last place I want to be. Yeah, I think that would make sense. I guess if you really enjoy partying, well, you know, I almost wonder if having that sort of, uh, you know, personality where you really, really enjoy partying and going out and, and just getting fucked up, like, can you still, I guess, you know, can how well can you really do at poker if you're also really focused on doing that? Because I know there's a lot of people, well, I mean, a lot, maybe five or six people I know from my own past that that was their downfall. That's why they didn't make it as poker players because they were too into that that lifestyle. They they didn't need to wake up, so they went out so much. They enjoyed the table service and they enjoyed the clubs and you know being friends with the other people that went out and did those kind of things. So yeah, definitely. Um, it's pretty hard to like maintain that type of lifestyle. Yeah. We got to get one of those partiers on here and see how they do it because I'm curious to see how they how they handle that sort of thing. Uh, Johnny says, "Ask him why he chose South Korea as his home base." Um, I spent a lot of time in Korea. Uh, every year, I probably go to Korea like three or four times, or maybe like two or three times a year, and uh, I just spent a lot of time in Korea. And I think it's pretty cool that like it has like a South Korean flag next to the name. You know you can um, you can just move and not change your country and poker stars, right? Yeah. Hmm. No, but, but I, I de- generally go to Korea very often. Like my family's there, and I just go to Korea pretty often, I guess. <laughs> someone, on Twitch, someone on Twitch made a uh, very bad comparison to what I was just saying. He said, 
<laughs> Look at Jay Farber. Dude's a 24-7 partier and came in second in the World Series of Poker main event. That's the trick, huh? Is, is that the key? The I'm going to ask you a question. I actually got to some point out my, uh, like, fire alarm detector is, like, beeping, so I'm going to go change the, uh, I'm going to go poke it or something to get it. Does BDDK ever date a Korean actress? I mean, do you date a Korean actress? You might actually. Is that do you? Uh, I, I do, I've never dated a Korean actress. <laughs> Man, that was a short question. Are you really gonna run and? No, no, no. I'm just like I'm just looking at some of the questions I'm getting like on Twitch and stuff like that, and then uh, like they're 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 very funny. Would BDDK play the Aria five hundred thousand dollar tournament this summer? That's my question. I leave you with. Go ahead. Well, the Aria five hundred thousand dollar tournament. Um. I have mixed feelings on this. Uh, I would like to think, yeah, there is no rake as far as I know, and like that's already a huge plus. And if I can, I would like to. I just not quite sure how I feel about it yet. But I, the good news is it's towards the end of the summer, and if things go well, and like I still have some time to work on my tournament game. Uh, hopefully play every Sunday until then. So a lot of things can change. I work really hard and try to like bring new things to the table all the time. So did, that's an I guess an I don't know. A big I don't know. How does somebody like how, like, like how do you play the five hundred thousand dollar tournament? Do you are you buying in with five hundred thousand dollar cash? Are you <laughs> like are you wiring five hundred thousand dollars? Are a lot of people buying pieces? Like how did talk us through? Some of us out here don't play five hundred thousand dollar tournaments. Believe it or not. Tell us about how, how do we play a $500,000 tournament, hypothetically, if we were able to and we knew the right people and we had the right skill level or the right money requirements, I guess. I've never played a $500,000 tournament. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a lot of money for a tournament. But um, almost all pros will have uh, pieces... Or, I'm sorry, almost all pros will be selling pieces. I can't imagine like someone having all of himself... How did they, I guess like you just. I don't. Know, it just seems like such a such a, a, a large. Well, I guess they've done the one drop obviously a couple times too. So there are these high buy-in tournaments that exist. I'm, I'm curious to see how the Aria five hundred thousand dollar tournament does, because I wouldn't be surprised if uh, if this Aria five hundred isn't better value than um, the, a lot of the hundred Ks. Just I think it try. It, the five hundred thousand dollars really attracts like a certain type of recreational player. Zero rake on such a big buy-in, um, and I, th I think it's probably going to be a really good event. Hmm. It's interesting. I wonder. I wonder how that works. I'm actually going to have the Aria Poker Room Empire boss, the, the Kim, the Kim Jung of the of the Aria Poker Room, on a podcast. So I'm going to ask him about this more. And we'll see what he says on it, because he's obviously the, probably the main guy who, who is behind this idea. So I'm, uh, I'm curious to see what, from his perspective, if he thinks that, like, what he thinks the turnout will be for that. Um, from what I hear, it's it's got like a pretty good number of quality players, and um, just the zero rake is also huge on such a large buy-in. So. I mean, if you can sell pieces, you can make this uh, tournament any any size you want, and like a lot of oftentimes, like rake is the biggest factor. Yeah, I wonder if uh, if they if they get rid of, I mean, if this start, might start to be a new trend in some of the high rollers where they sort of do them with no rake. I wonder if if that might be a strategy moving forward that some tournament series will take. I think it's a definitely a good strategy because like. It just seems so glamorous, and um, it gets people to play poker. And like the whole no rake idea is probably the reason why I'm kind of on the fence. If it wasn't for the no rake, then like I don't. I mean, if they were raking like two percent, which is like generally very very small for a tournament, I might be out. And it's not because um, of like I think my ROI is just like two percent, and I obviously wouldn't play because I would be breaking even. But just I don't know, there are a lot of people that are like just see the no rake and like think that's like good enough for them. Um, 
But $500,000 is a lot of money to get together. That's a lot of money. I know. It seems like it'd be a lot of money, but also it seems like for... Yeah, I mean, you need it a, seems lot like a lot of money, man. Fuck, I, that seems like a lot of money to to just get together for a tournament. I know. Uh, I think uh, Jason, Jason Les, shout out to Jason. He's in the chat right now, and I think uh, Doug are also supposed to be playing that as well. I, I'm not sure. Who, I, someone told me this on chat, or I think uh, Anfield told me on Skype. I'm not sure if that's actually confirmed or not, but it seems like they have. They don't have a problem getting this this amount of money together for a tournament. So. Ansky. No, uh, Jason, or my friend. No, no, another. Someone else told me this. Uh, no, I don't think you know him. I'm not sure how he knows, but this is what he told me. So. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they're they're definitely playing. Well, I guess if you need help getting, uh, <laughs> this is gonna be a trolling comment. I'm not even gonna say that. What's your, uh, what's your most? You don't sound very degenerate, and we've been getting a lot of good degen stories here on the podcast lately. What's your most degenerate moment that's happened for you? That you can talk about, I suppose. That I can talk about? I'm not really degen. I mean, I've definitely had my degen moments, but I'm not really that that degen. I'm sorry, that's a that's a tough question to ask or answer, like live. Okay, so there is a degen moment. You are you do have some degen moments. It's just I I have some few I have a few degen moments. Okay. What's your best Vegas story? Do you have a, a degenerate Vegas story, a memorable Vegas story that might have happened there? Nope, I'm not. I'm <laughs> sorry, guys. I'm definitely not the Mr. Vegas story guy. I'm just like another Asian that plays online poker. <laughs> well, if you want to create some stories, uh, the guy to hang out with might be Jungle Man because he seems to fucking do some of the weirdest, weirdest stories and the craziest things that I that I've heard someone talk about, so he might be the one, if you want to get some life experience, seek out Jungle Man. He'll be the person to... Uh, I will pass on life experience for Jungle Man. <laughs> I know Doug's kind of, he's married now, so I'm not sure if he's a... Uh, he, well, I guess he's not technically not married, but he's on the way to getting married, so he, uh, he might not be as adventurous as he was in his younger age. Uh, Sammy says, ask him if he's played Jungle Man heads up and thoughts on Jungle Man's game. Uh, I have played... Jungle Man. I think he might be like the. Th I've played a lot of hands with Jungle Man. He's like definitely in the top five of like most hands played. Um, I think Jungle is really really tough. He is a fighter for all sizes of pots. Um, I think he's tough. I, he's definitely very a top player, and it's what he's accomplished is actually pretty impressive. I mean, oh, I forgot to mention Jungle, but I was thinking um for the who's the top pros that would stand uh, would stood the the time. Mm -hmm. I think it's Ike and sort of Jungle Man, but he was like kind of new to the scene at one point. But I think Jungle's really tough. I cannot think of a player that's like as tough. Do you have a uh, updated power rankings list right now if you had to make a, a top five or a top six? Uh, uh, okay. Well, um, no, I don't have one. Sorry. Can you name six players that might be in that list in no particular order? Okay, I can do that. That makes me feel a lot better, actually. Okay. Um, I would think Jungle, in no particular order, Jungle, Doug, me, I assume Ike, I assume Ike, Flushy, is that six? Um, I think that was five. That was five. Should I... Nick Frame? Okay. What happened to Asian Flushy? What, is that the... What, who's, the who's the guy that... Something happened. I don't know what happened, but something happened to someone. Was that Flushy? Asian Flushy? Yeah, something happened to Flushy. He, he's, uh, he's a little MIA right now. Where, fuck, where is he? Is he not playing poker anymore? What happened? Where did he go? I'm not really sure. I'm sure he's playing poker somewhere. Huh. He's always playing poker. That guy is always playing poker. He's really a grinder. Plays like any sort of cash games. Like he has like a really good avenue of like different types of games. And um, I'm sure he's like one of the most successful online poker players in the past like year or two. Hmm. I know he works really hard. R.I.P. Agent Flushy Jason says he will be missed. 
He will be missed. Asian fleshy story, man. We gotta, we gotta, we gotta get that story one day. I'm, I don't know much about the story, but I guess uh, a certain live stream J Mo might have been something might have happened. I'm not quite sure. So, uh, someone asked earlier in the chat, and actually a new name I haven't recognized, so I want to ask his question. He said, "Ask him about Christopher Vogelsing, who I think is like two zero six one seven nine four two or some screen name like that." Yeah. Have you ever played what about him? Have you ever played with him before? Uh, yes, I have played with him a year ago. Um, I think he's really good. Actually, he, he would probably be mixed up in the top six somewhere. I think he's really good. Um, uh, that was Jordy. I've Jordy met him at that. Uh, I met him. I formally introduced myself to him at PCA because it's someone I've played, but. Uh, it seems like a really, really nice guy, and I know he's well respected in the high stakes community. Hmm. I like I like the way you answer questions about people. Really? Just go ahead. I'll be okay. You, I'll be you. Ask me a question. You be me. I'll be you for a second. Ask me something about someone. What do you think about Douglas Polk? Hmm. I think Doug plays really well. <laughs> okay, okay, I get it. I think he's one of the top players right now. I have a lot of respect for his game. He's somebody I look up to a lot. I think he's a really good player. Go ahead, ask me another. Ask me about somebody else that might that might uh, intrigue Big Dick Dong or Kim. Okay, I'll I'll try to. F <laughs> no, no, I'm not, I like it. I, believe me, I like the politically correct approach. I don't mind it. I'm I I just enjoy the answers. I enjoy the. Uh, I enjoy. It. I enjoy that. I, I, I really just don't have anything bad to say about anybody. Yeah. I technically don't have anything bad to say about... Nah, I got something bad to say about, like, three people. But I don't have much bad things to say about some people either as well. But you're like a you're like a, a, a public relations company dream, man. You're like the guy... They need to, like, send send this recording of you to their to their clients and be like, this is how you answer questions about anything. DJ moment, none. This person, respect. <laughs> That person love his game. So anyway, <laughs> oh man, <laughs> TT, if you're out there, shout out to my boy Steve McLaughlin. If you're out there, send this interview of Donger to the clients, and that and that this is how you do a, a, a proper interview for sure. Let's see. Uh, what did uh, Joey? Could you ask him what does he? Oh, pretty deep, deep question there, Frank. Joey, could you ask him what does he think when adjusting to his opponent, <laughs> and when does he know to a no to adjust in the first place? Uh, you just you just know because he knows that you know that I know that he knows. You just go from there. Hmm. Do you do, is this? Uh, <laughs> I'm not gonna follow up with that question. Uh, someone said how GTO is your game, but I'm pretty sure I don't I don't know if he's kidding or not. So. I, uh, I'm not sure if he's actually kidding or not. I don't know. What's your most memorable poker moment, I guess? Is it, is it the TC from the UB uh, winning that bet? Definitely. Yeah. And yep. so your goals for the rest of the 2015 are focus more on tournaments while also maintaining a high level at no limit and potentially winning some sort of uh, prestigious tournament? Yeah, that's... Probably where everything is headed. Hmm. We'll see about the tournament. I mean, like, hopefully it's a tournament. That seems like the most glamorous way. Do you have anything else you're probably... working? Do you have what anything else you're working on this year? Like, do you have any other goals outside of poker? Is there something else you're trying to get better at? Is it kind of just poker, poker, poker for right now? It sounds kind of boring, but I really, really enjoy playing poker. I, I always have, and ever since I, like, Googled how to play poker, I've just been addicted to it, and there's nothing bad about, like, just really enjoying playing poker. I don't think so either. I think what you find sometimes is once people reach the highest stakes, they're always looking to branch out. They're looking to, you know, start a business or invest in something or learn how to go uh, snowboarding in Antarctica or you know, learn how to be a sailboat captain. So I didn't know if there was something like that maybe you're trying to get into. Maybe it's, I don't know what they do in South Korea. What do they do in South Korea? The cuddle, the cu are you going to open a cuddle? Uh, a cuddle, what's the cuddle thing called where you go and cuddle with someone, you pay them money? What? 
what's the cuddle things called where you go cuddle with someone for money? Have you ever been to one of those? I have no idea what you're talking about. You cuddle someone for money? Yes, it's called like a cuddle. I thought this was in South Korea. Maybe this is uh maybe this is Thailand. I'm not quite sure. I don't I'm I'm not quite up to date on, on those things, but I don't. Maybe you wanted to invest in something like that or start your own cuddle cafe. Cuddle cafe, that's what it's called. Yes, I watched that's some weird ass like Bad business model. Who the hell would pay money to cuddle with someone? That's a great question. I have an answer for you. There's a documentary on YouTube. Go look it up. I'm, there's people they go there to cut. That's Japan. Okay, I'm not a goddamn professional Japan. So I'm not. How do I know that? Okay, first of all. But yeah, they go there and you cuddle with someone for money, I guess. And I don't know if you talk or what. I don't exactly know what happens, but yeah, it's it's. Uh, that, that's. <laughs> why would you cuddle? I don't know. That's that's really weird. I'm sure you could pay someone better to cuddle with. Why would you do that? I don't know, man. Maybe some people that don't have girlfriends. I don't know, man. I wonder, I when I watched the documentary, I wondered that myself. Uh, Jason says, ask him, ask him to tell the story about getting stacked for one thousand big blinds at Bellagio. Ooh, okay. Oh, man, that was. This was a long time ago, and uh, this is a really long time ago. But at the time, I think it was like basically my first time at like a casino that like had poker running, and it wasn't like a thousand big blinds. It was kind of close though but <clears throat> I didn't understand why people were uh, people had more than you know 100 big blinds in a casino especially in Vegas and I found out that like it's just uh, what is it called uncapped so I this is a really bad decision God but I bought in to a 1020 game I believe and uh, for with like two or three thousand, which is like very standard. But then I noticed that like everyone had like forty billion dollars on the table, and I didn't understand why. I just got received the cash out. Um, I paid like some money, uh, some big to like receive cash, and like this is the most amount of cash I've ever like had in my hands. And I think this was like literally like twenty five percent of my net worth. And I thought I would be cool and like put it on the table just like everybody else. And it got really scary because at the time I was like a 50 cent 1-1-2 one, one, player. What? Wait, now, what? Wait, hold on. You're playing 50 cent dollar 1-2? You, you put... <clears throat> what? Why would you do that? I, I was trying to be cool. I was 21. I was retarded. I, I guess this is like one of my stupid degen. It wasn't really even degen. It was just stupid. And this is degen, too. You were playing 50 cent dollar 1-2 and you went to play 10-20 live and... And just put like okay, go on, let's go. You got the you got the stack. Okay, what happens now? And now they're straddling and shit. Now this is like way too big of a game for me. It was a good game, but I really just wanted to leave. Um, and then what happened was uh, some dude limped. I had aces. I raised really big. I was so happy to just take it down right there. I would have been happy, but I didn't. I ended up getting stacked. This guy. Wait, no, I'm sorry. I didn't have aces. I got stacked by aces. I had kings. I'm even getting the story wrong. I had kings. I opened. The bro who limped under the gun after the straddle limp raised me. And now I'm shitting bricks. I call. And long story short, I was set over set. And no, 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 I... no, 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 no. We don't need a long story. Let's take the short story for this version. All right, so how much did you buy in for preflop? Or how I'm sorry, how much, what the fuck am I even talking about? I'm reading comments and talking. How much did you have in your stack before the flop? So you had 20k or in front of you or more? No, I had less. Okay. I had less. I was like losing a little bit in the game, and at this, at, I'm pretty sure at this point I just wanted to leave because I was down like three or four k. It was like a five, a 10, 20, 40 game, I mean that was like three or four k. I don't think I've ever lost three or four k, and now I have like 20% of my on the ro of my roll on the table. Man, that was okay. so bad. Okay, so you're showing off. You're you're flexing the big dick. Guy limps yeah, under the gun. The big dick. You you guy limps under the gun for forty. You ISO probably to like two sixty or three hundred or some crazy like live poker array size. I, I think it was bigger shit. He limps he limp me. signifying he's got aces. And yeah, he's got aces. I call. Flop. I. I flop a boat. 
he checks, I bet, he raises me, I call, and somewhere, either the Turner River, I have aces, or he has aces and I have kings, and like, it was such a, it's such a, seems like such a made up story, but like, man, that was like, such a brutal beat, and I just remember like, just running out of the room, and like, I left all my stuff there, and like, I just hated life, and actually, I think, now that I think about it, I think I had, that was like 30% of my roll. Yeah. You uh, you might you might be the most overrolled fifty cent dollar one two four I've ever heard in my life. Definitely, definitely, I was such a nit. I had like five hundred like buy-ins for like the stake I was playing. I think at the time I just like I just played a lot of poker, and the way I viewed poker was um have good hands, play a lot of poker. You're probably not good enough to play higher, but just play a lot of poker to make up for it. And like that's really what like. Just kept driving me, and even till today, even till today, I still play as much poker as possible. But just like I do understand the value of playing higher and like doing work off the table, and I think the the work ethic really came from not being able to play, and like knowing that my next match with that player might be the last. What do you mean? Um, just because like you, if you play. Uh, while moving up, I noticed that I thought like I would get more action from a lot of players, and I didn't. I, it was just, it was just like a few hands to like a few hundred hands to like a little bit of table bluffing to. I'm surprised they didn't even play me one hand or um, just a lot of things. Just kind of, I thought I was going to get a lot more action from a lot of other players. Um, whether I mean, I thought I had a pretty big edge, and I thought it was a. Uh, I thought I was not necessarily being deceiving, but I thought I was viewed as a much lesser player than I. And it was like actually like bittersweet. I was getting a little bit more credit than I thought I would be getting, but I knew that it was like kind of good and bad at the same time. Hmm. Actually, really, uh, I'm still thinking about the hand you told. Feedback. Oh my god. So you you you. I don't want to go back to. Uh, um, Sorry, I'm hearing feedback in the in the microphone again. Let me uh, let me stop hearing that. Stop feedback. Stop. Stop. Feedback. Okay, so you lose the hand. You ran out of the room. Yeah, basically. I mean, it was face planted and like I was actually there. I. It was kind of like my birthday has just passed, or it was for my birthday or something in Vegas with some of my friends. It would. I think the only time I ever played live poker before was like probably playing 2-5 and that was like it wasn't a big game for me but this was just such a bad decision. It, I just saw like people having like lots of money in front of them and kind of wanted to show off and didn't pay off. Yeah. Well, we won't talk about that moment anymore. But that moment kind of sounds sad. Fucking echo. Uh, Kelly the realist OG asks, ask him if Beyond, I don't know how to say this word, Beyond Diggy tastes good. Uh, no. What is that? I have no idea. Beyond, Beyond Diggy? Uh, let's see what it is. A popular snack food in Korea cuisine, literally meaning crystals or pupa in Korean. Beyond Diggy are streamed or boiled? Uh, I don't know what do, that is. Do you live in South Korea? Do you not eat Korea? I think you just have like a super white accent, and like I would know it if you like said it correctly. If you're Korean, I would I would probably recognize it. Oh, yeah, probably. It's okay, super standard. Maybe I'm saying it wrong. I'm not sure. I'm just listening to my echo, and I'm I'm getting distracted by my echo, kind of. Oh, went away. That's good. Such horrible pronouncing. Yeah, I guess I am pronouncing it pretty horribly, I suppose. So, I apologize for that, guys. I don't know how to pronounce Korean words. Although I don't know how to pronounce most most words in general. So, I guess that's a, a leak of mine. Callie says, I think he is fake Korean. Hmm. Fake Korean. Uh, a lot of people think I look Chinese. Or at least the Asians do. Or at least the Asians do, yeah. Hmm. That's uh, 
That's a racist comment waiting to happen. I'm not saying anything about that, Donger. That's you look you look Korean. I didn't I didn't, I didn't say the white people. White people always get a pass in my book. <laughs> okay, if you had to give one piece of poker advice to somebody out there who might be at fifty cent dollar, twenty five cent, fifty cent, one two, what would you give to them to potentially moving up the stakes? I would say shit, what is the most politically correct thing to say here? <laughs> I would just really just work hard and don't be lazy and really don't be stupid with your bankroll. It's just m many poker players just fail because like they just live beyond their means. Okay, I like that one. That's I like that one. one. That was a good one, huh? Yeah, I agree. John says, Joey, make my first final table tonight. Came in eighth then went on the cash table and got a double off off Nano Noko. Well, you not only sound like a degenerate, but congratulations for taking advantage of the podcast. Run good, John. And I hope you keep it up, my friend. Congratulations. Um, if you had to give someone a, a life advice moment out there, what would, you, what would you give to them right now? Man, you keep asking me questions that have to be super politically correct. What the fuck? Why do you need to be, so, are, why do you need to be politically correct? For who? For the Joey podcast. No, you don't even believe it. You, no, you can say anything you want right now, kid. Life you advice? Want, hey, it's just me and you. It's just me and you, big dick. It's just me and you, buddy. Have a seat, man. Sit down. It. Talk to me. What, what, one piece of life advice to someone. What would you give them? <laughs> just live your life to the fullest. Try to stay away from a job. Keep playing poker. Play more tournaments. Play more heads up, no limit. Yeah. Well, I, I would agree with most of that, except take out tournaments and heads up, no limit, and add in PLO. And that would be my advice to you. Play more Pile in Omaha. It's a great game. Donger Kim, why don't you come over to Pile in Omaha, man? It's a great game. Ah, uh, the fresh game. new blood. It's a, it's, a, it's a fun game, man. You got, you got players like Phil Galfond playing... Ike, Ike Hollywood Haxton in the game. I mean, Sean LaFort. These are easy, these are guys just waiting to play. Yeah, I bet those guys must be really, really good. Nah, I guess. I guess. <laughs> All right, guys, we'll take some questions from the chat right now. If anybody has something, it's starting to become awkward. <laughs> no. Donner Kim's a shot. He's a, he's a shy guy. He doesn't want he doesn't want to ruffle any feathers. He doesn't want anybody sending him mean things on Twitter. He doesn't want any of the guys giving him a lot of hateful feedback. So he's got to be you got to be a little bit more politically correct. I understand. Uh, I'm waiting for some questions. There's a little bit of a delay. I love how you're just laughing right now. <laughs> I'm gonna get the real answers from you later uh, after we're done actually on Skype and then. I'll post them anonymously so that people can get the, uh, could get the <laughs> what is the least politically correct thing he's ever told somebody? <laughs> Do you have an answer for that? I don't have a list for that. No, I don't. <laughs> uh, Penn says, could you ask him how many hours per week he studies his game? A lot, actually. I guess a little less with Heads Up No Limit now, but used to be a lot, definitely a lot. Yeah. Uh, I, I think Nick mentioned this before, and one thing I could really relate to him was, uh, I, mean, I guess I'm not even speaking for Nick, but I was definitely not like a naturally talented player, um, and a lot of my success came from the hard work. So, yeah, that, I think that's... I, I could never make those sick reads that everyone seems to make. Like Jungle. Jungle is like such a naturally good talent. Like he just has like the sickest intuition. It's kind of frustrating. It's actually extremely frustrating when Jungle is right. So frustrating. <laughs> just because he's, uh, he's right because... I just know he's just so happy on the other side of that monitor. He just must be so happy when he gets me. But Jungle <laughs> is like just like... A very good intuitive player, whereas like I'm definitely not. I don't think I have like, well, at least for heads up no limit. Yeah. 
Uh, Poker Staples, Jamie, asks a, a question, but not sure if this is a lot of answer a lot of people like to give. He says, what's the biggest thing other poker players do worse than you? Which probably is, I guess, would assume work ethic. You probably think that most poker players yeah. do worse than you. You just work harder than they do. The biggest thing that poker players do that is worse than you. Oh, that that depends on the player. That there, a lot of everyone has like a lot of. I guess in general. So what's the difference between you and someone who's playing one two no limit right now? What do you think that they're doing? Uh, they're doing that you're doing better than them, like or in general. I guess that's a very that's like a question where. Hmm. Yeah, some people would be comfortable answering that question. Some people want to keep those things to themselves because they don't want somebody to to even know. I guess. In general, I would think that like people. I don't know. Everyone's so different. Everyone is really different. Someone's like. I think probably, I don't know. Hmm. I don't know. Okay. okay. Actually, what is something that generally people do really a lot? I guess they, they're just, some people are like, I think the biggest problem is like some people are just too aggressive. That's usually not like a good sign in heads up no limit. Aggressive, I guess, all streets in general, not specifically in one spot or just in general. Yeah, people just usually are just too aggressive everywhere. I think. Okay. Uh, Frank asked this question seven times, and I'm going to ask it finally, Frank. What's the most exhilarating thing that has happened to you? Uh, honestly, I, I feel like bluffing is very exhilarating, but there was this, like, specific bluff versus Nick Frame that I thought was really exhilarating because I was down so much, and I thought I sh I just thought it was going to be a very devastating moment if I got called there, but I got a fold, and, like, things turned around, and I was, like, very, very happy. Uh, I think Nick might know which hand I'm talking about. You think? Uh, you think Nick's gonna watch this? And, and uh, you think Nick's gonna watch the thing? Watch the podcast? Probably. Probably. Yeah. Uh, okay. Everyone keeps asking for a Jungle Man impression, so I I don't I think you might have gave us one in the preview podcast, but I'm not sure if you did give us a Jungle Man impression. You do you have a Jungle Man impression for everyone? Everyone keeps asking. They want to see a Jungle Man impression. Jungle Man impression. I don't. Is, is, I guess this is kind of a Jungle Man impression. Like, uh, I don't know. I don't. I, I'm so. I, I can't do the impression thing. No, I didn't. I, we did. I think we talked about how I can't do impressions. I think that was me. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I honestly, I can't do impressions either, although my Ike Hollywood Haxton impression is coming along quite well, but I can't, like, I can't do a Jungle Man impression. Durr impression we do sometimes, I'm not so good at that as well, so, but the Ike Hollywood Haxton, I've been studying that a lot, and I've been uh, getting better at that. 100, day, 100 Days says, comments on the famous call down. Oh, I guess Danielle, shout out to my boy Daniele, what's up? Call down of Jungle Man with Queen High. Um, I don't really know that hand myself. I, know, I relatively know it, but I don't know much about it to actually talk about it. So I don't have anything. Uh, I don't want to talk about that because I actually don't remember the hand. Um, <laughs> the hand with me? Um, I'm not sure. It was the hand with you? It where he called down with Queen Queen High? I don't remember much about it. Uh, I don't know if it. Well, I know he's called me down with King High for all the money in the three up pot. But he does that a lot. Sometimes he's right. And that's when you like get the most frustrated. Yeah. These questions are just. <laughs> We're getting a lot of questions on the Twitch side for you, Donger. But some of them are. Imagine King impression? What? Dan Coleman impression? What? Dan Ziggy impression? <laughs> yeah, they they have a lot of impressions that they want to hear. 
Well, we're going to work on our impression game for next time, Donger. Yeah, if you, um, you gave me a heads up, I would have, like, practiced some impressions and... Yeah, I don't want to put you on this on the spot for some of these guys, some of these impressions, man. I uh, I know I know you were kind of coming on here. You some you know the interview the whole entire thing. Sometimes you get you know you're a little bit more reserved. You get are you you kind of nervous about them. So are you feeling a little bit better now at the end, or do you think you're still as nervous as when we started? Uh, I'm always better at towards the end. Yeah. yeah. I think that's what happens most most of the time. People open up and they get a little more comfortable, and they realize it's not that big of a deal. I mean, I guess it is in a way. If you say something wrong, it stays forever, I suppose. Which you know could be kind of, you know, especially if someone tells a story about themselves and they look like an idiot. Now that's out there. Everyone knows that. Everyone knows this story now, and it's sort of embarrassing, I think, for some people. So. Yeah, this is all. This attention is just all very new to me. I I just I've always viewed online poker as a something you do anonymously and like you just watch people on TV that just chose to be famous or like are famous for whatever reason and I never thought that like an online poker thing would like get me to do an interview and I also I guess like the the large buying um, tournaments thing helps the case yeah I think with um, obviously as you get more into tournaments sort of being in the public sort of comes along with that as you're playing those higher buy and stuff. So it's just kind of something that almost goes along with it in a way. You know, it sounds like you're not necessarily want the, I guess, the notoriety that comes with, I guess, being a high stakes player or being a tournament player, but more just the accomplishment and uh, the glory that comes along with it. Yeah, I, I didn't think that this is what I wanted, but it is nice to, like, get accomplished or be acknowledged for what I've done in Heads Up No Limit. I like that more than I thought I would. Yeah. yeah. I guess the... Uh, you know, it's interesting, because I think some people see poker as, like, their avenue to become well-known and respected for something. I think we all want to be respected for something that we're good at. And But there's some people that just absolutely very much dislike any sort of notoriety and any sort of like putting themselves out there at all. And were you like that for a, a quite a while and, and this sort of just came about because of the prop bet for the most part? Yes, I would definitely classify myself in that category. Um, I didn't think this uh, challenge would be uh, as big as it really was with the whole like amount of people that apply or replied and like how many views it has like I was actually very surprised yeah I think uh, I didn't think it was extremely that big either but I mean anytime you get a bet where you know two of the most respected players at the heads of no limit are playing and people are betting the amounts of money on the side that they bet then I think that's going to attract. Plus, in poker right now, there's really no one doing anything super exciting. So that was one of the first exciting things that really came around. And I think that's probably why it became so popular. So Yeah, that makes sense. I, would, I mean, I was just very surprised for something that was uh, for 2550. Seems like after all that's happened to online poker with, like, the Durr thing, playing the nosebleeds, and like just all the other challenges or all the mixed game like nosebleed games. I didn't think like a heads up no limit game would be attract so much attention. Well, now it has. Now we're here. Now you're gonna go win a bracelet in 2015. If anyone wants to take a bracelet prop bet against Dong or Kim, I'm looking to book all action against him. Let me know what price <laughs> you're interested in. And remember, everyone, remember my challenge to you guys. If you see Dong or Kim at a tournament stop anywhere in Korea, he'll be playing in Korea very coming up soon. If you see him at the World Series of Poker, if you see him at an EBT event, shout out, Big Dick Dong or Kim, yell it out loud. Make sure you, you, you tell him his nickname, tell him you know his nickname, and please let me know when you do because <sighs> the best nickname in, in poker right now, Big Dick Dong or Kim, my friend. Do you have anything else to add? No. Nope. That's it. All right, boys. We're gonna wrap things up here. Um, I know we had a lot of, I know we had a lot of uh, comments and questions, but we will save those for another time. I'll be, I'm sure I'll meet up with Dong or Kim at the World Series of Poker, and 
we're gonna we're gonna get him to do something degenerate. That's a, one of our goals now for 2015. For me personally, is to get Donger Kim to do something degenerate in Las Vegas this summer. And that's pretty much it, man. Donger Kim, thanks for coming on, guys. Thanks I'll, for having me. I'll, I'll be back Sunday actually with uh, Easter Sunday, a special Easter Sunday Poker Life podcast with the one and only Sean Lafort, the fit, debatably fitness man in poker. And also, I'll be back Monday or Tuesday, I'm not sure which day, with uh, Donnie Stern, Anski, Supernova 9. Going to have him back on, see what he's been up to. And um, that's it, man. That's all. Guys on Twitch, guys on YouTube, much love. And uh, we're done. Peace out. See ya.